The best HR leaders are teaching their management team how to have hard conversations. It doesn't mean people want to have them. Just think about marriages and people who leave. How many times do you hear somebody left and they're like, I had no idea there was a problem. We have halfway conversations at work. And despite whatever training HR or anybody else gives, most people will default to a halfway conversation and say what is halfway to the truth and hope that somebody understands 100% of what they're trying to say. And as a result, we are left, all of us, decoding what is actually happening. It's one of my mm-hmm. biggest frustrations with the workplace. And if you look at my book, The Unspoken Truths for Career Success, almost every chapter has woven into it the conversations you need to have and communication is a theme, just this recurring theme that if you as an individual get better at communicating, your career can go where you want it to go. And as a manager, you can have better experiences with your people. So much is solved with better communication. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be the same person that hires and fires people all day long? Well, during today's podcast, you're going to learn. But since I know you're going to love this podcast and episode, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe to Dr. Patty Ann's podcast. So today, I have a woman that does just that. She hired people, she fired people, and she's helped people navigate the incredibly complicated waters of business success. So allow me the privilege to welcome Tessa White to our podcast today. Welcome, Tessa. You, what a nice introduction. Oh, it's great, 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 great. Thank you so much. I am really excited um, to hear your secrets. But before I do, I have a a question I wanna ask you about yourself. And that is, I would like you to share with all of us an experience that you've had in your life. It can be professional. It can be personal. personal. It could be yesterday. It could be 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, Something that happened to you that very much shaped who you are today. However, here's the caveat. And it must be something that people cannot Google about you, what you haven't written about something that most people don't know. And people love to tell me, no, 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 I'm an open book. I'm like, no, no, no. Everyone's got stuff that other people don't know about. Well, probably let's think that's a great question and a hard one because so much of what I do is in the public forum. I would say uh, one of the things that shaped me that I have not talked about a lot is happened very early. My father owned a bunch of clothing stores. And at the age of about eight years old, he would bring me into work with him. And I would help. It was a, he had specialty denim. And I would help price all of the denim and stack them. And I would go to the store and at Christmas, I would wrap presents. But I basically worked full time for my father in his store and was raised in an entrepreneurial environment. And I think it really shaped me um, to love work. I have always loved work, but it helped me understand what business looks like in a very safe space. And at a very young age, I was, I think I was, um, taught a lot about kind of the principles of business. And that came through later in life when I, I never mm-hmm. expected I was going to work. I became a single mom and I'm like, Oh, I guess I will be working for a living. And I was able to apply those principles that my father taught me and ease into that and feel quite at home in that work world. So I guess that would be okay. it. So, so that, that's, thank you for sharing that. So um, at eight, you were doing that with your dad? That's right. I went to work every day with him. And and at age 15, I was leaving high school and going on trips, buying trips in L.A., to actually buy the clothes for the store. And he would put, I remember once he put me in a room. It was this big tower, the buying mart in LA. And I was 15 years old. And he said, this is my daughter. She will be the buyer. I'm going to leave. I'll be back in an hour. Whatever she says goes. And there I was with the designer showing me their clothes and, and ordering what we were going to put in the store. 
Oh gosh, there's so many so many places I could go go with that. But um, did your dad love his work too? Is that where you picked up the concept? Because I know so many people that will talk, and I'm sure you do too, right? Like, oh my dad hate there's a hated their work. Like, there's a line in a movie. I think it was Richard Gere that said he's on a train and he's looking out the train and and he's commuting. And I think it's from New York from Manhattan into Westchester, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. And he and either he says it or the overview says, whatever they call it, the voiceover says, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm-hmm. And it's the concept of most people hate their job. So my sense is that your dad loved his work. I don't know that he did love it. And in fact, if you fast forward, he ended up having a really difficult exit and losing almost everything. Uh, when all was said and done with the stores. Um, and oh, you have he, to tell us this story. Yeah, he ended up, it was a time when, so small boutique stores ruled the day. And my father had these right. small boutique stores all over. And then the big chains came in. And when the chains mm-hmm. came in, it pushed out the little guy. And so my father had a really hard time and eventually lost the stores and ended up as a salesman at Nordstrom um, at age mm-hmm. like 43 or something. And I know oh, wow. that was really difficult for him. So he didn't love work, but what he did instill in me as a woman living in Utah, where women typically were taught to stay home and raise your kids. Well, and, especially in your community, as, your LDS community. Right? right. Especially in my community. My father taught me over and over, Tessa, you can do anything you set your mind to. You can be anything that you want to be. And I think that's the great lesson that he that he instilled in me that helped me because did I did I necessarily want my life to take the turn that it did and get divorced with three kids and no college degree? Oh, heavens no. But but my dad instilled confidence in me that I could I could start from scratch and I could figure it out. And then as mm-hmm. I rose in companies, I think there were points where I thought, no, I, that's not a job I should have. I'm not qualified enough. I didn't, I don't have enough of an education. I'm not enough. And I would stop and remember his words. And I think, you know, if you fast forward 25 years and there I am in New York City at Blackstone headquarters, you know, in Manhattan running a board meeting. And I remember thinking in that moment, I can't believe I'm here. I did mm-hmm. it. I did it. Mm-hmm. And that was mm-hmm. not, of course, the end of my career, nor was I, I, I falsely believed I'd reach some pinnacle of, you know, something. And then you realize you're always fighting for relevancy and, and it's always hard. But um, the, the fact that I achieved what I did is largely due to my father's example. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're pretty similar that way. Um, my dad died when I was, when we were young, left my mom widowed with five kids. Wow. But I never... And he started the sports program where we grew up, and I was one of five. And since his oldest three were girls, guess what? They had girls' sports, which I did not know at the time Mm -hmm. was trailblazing, right? And this is a very traditional conservative neighborhood, very trailblazing. And I remember when I I wrote my first book and I was dedicating it to, to my parents, he said, you know, it never dawned on me that doors would be close to me because I was a girl. It, yeah. I, like I never got that message. Like I mm-hmm. was raised, you can be, do whatever you want. Now, knowing me, I, it also could be possible that somebody might've said that to me. And mm-hmm. I was like, that makes no sense. So, so like I have, I, I am notorious for filtering. I like not hearing <laughs> what doesn't resonate with me. So right. maybe someone somewhere along the way did say it, but if they did, I totally disqualify that, which is not the story for many, many women. That's right. right. Or, mm-hmm. and, and in fairness, a lot of men were taught, you know, there's these limiting beliefs that we, we don't, we're not born with. Um, but let, let's go back to your story though, because it sounds quite interesting so you, I would imagine you got married at a, a relatively young age. Like, t- tell us about that. Oh, you, I, yeah, children. I was, I was married at age nineteen. Didn't even know who I was. I can't even believe it when, in hindsight, that I got married that young. 
And well, a few that's years. Pretty, that's not unusual in the LDS no, church back not then, at all. right? Yeah. No, not at all. And I don't remember thinking that marriage was difficult, by the way. I, I really <laughs> liked it and enjoyed it and kind of got into that rhythm. I had children a few years later. And so now, as a you know, 56 year old woman, my children are grown and it's fantastic because I had them young. I can enjoy them yeah. differently as an adult, but I had these three children and my uh, spouse you were baby about, having babies. It, I was. Yeah. And then yeah. my spouse came out and said, I'm gay and I do not want to be married anymore. And I had no degree and I had a job, but not a job that could pay for my kids. And I can remember just, you know, on my knees, just begging, please let me find something that I can provide for my family because I don't want my kids to be scared about their life. And I I want to be able to put food on the table and have them feel secure. Even though I was terrified, I couldn't make the house payment, didn't know what to do. And I ended up in HR working for Stephen R. Covey which was what a godsend, you know, one of the world's leadership gurus is who I worked for Mm -hmm. one of my first jobs. And it taught me so much. I I was just on a mastermind with Stephen M. R. Covey yesterday. Yes. He's fantastic too. Dear friend of mine. In fact, he's the one he, he uh, endorsed my book. So anyway, I, uh, yeah, I, I had to figure it out and um, I got divorced. I started working and I started working my way up. I started as a secretary that was my first career job, moved into a benefits specialist, moved into recruiting, moved up in HR and ended up making a really great career out of running, you know, helping companies, big companies, Fortune. I worked in uh, Fortune 15 companies um, managing HR and and then eventually about four years ago said, yeah, I think I'm going to retire. I'm going to go fly fishing. And then the pandemic hit and I you cannot lock me in a house. That, there's no way. So I built a website and I started the job doctor and became an accidental influencer when my daughter posted a few of my videos online. And my son called three days later and he goes, Mom, I don't think this is possible. But my girlfriend said she saw you on TikTok. Are you actually on TikTok? And I said, oh, that's right. I forgot we posted something. Let me go check that. And I had 10,000 followers. And so it's just continued since then. And so this accidental right, well, hang influencer. On a second, though. We'll, yeah. we'll go back to that. But I want I want to go back to an LDS community. Somebody mm-hmm. comes out and says they're gay. I mean, d- I'm not being sarcastic. Did you even know what that was? And that must have taken incredible courage on your ex's part. And And that must have been such a, I don't even know what the word, besides trauma for you, but in the community, like, oh, it was awful. That's not it. Yeah, it was, it was awful. About that. So my a former husband, um, who's now deceased, but he was a good, oh, sorry. a good, good man. And I'm, I, I want to preface it by saying, I'm so glad that he was able to live his truth eventually. Right. Right. Um, of course. So I don't bear any ill will about that. And in fact, I'm an advocate in the LGBTQ community. Um, but um, it was awful because neighbors wouldn't let my children play with their children. Oh my god. And gosh. so I, I and there were vicious rumors that I had HIV. And I you know that that time in my life was very lonely, incredibly hard because I was not only trying to figure out how to put food on the table. Uh, my uh my ex-spouse was suffering with depression after he left and he had to be committed for a period of time. And then my children were falling apart and friends, you know, couldn't play with them. And it was incredibly challenging. And then and then you have child care on top of it. You're trying to figure out who do I trust to take care of my children. So I I was pretty resilient through it and we all got through it. But oh my gosh, what a what a tough time. In hindsight, I I'm so glad for what I learned, but I would never want to do it again. Yeah, I I am. Um... I, 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 you don't have to answer this question, but I, for some reason, I have so many LDS clients that are, are active, like devout LDS and have uh-huh. left. And, and this one particular man, he left, he had five children and he knew it was going to cost him his marriage. And he so courageous and such a good man. Like he's such a good man. Um, 
But I guess I'm curious as to, were you tempted to leave the church? With I mean, you know, it's been mm-hmm. enough, you, your marriage falls apart, and now these religious people mm-hmm. are so unkind to your children that mm-hmm. have nothing to do with what their father's done. Interestingly, no. And, and it's not that I agree with the LDS church's um, opinion on LGBTQ. Mm-hmm. I don't, but I find great community in worshiping and sp- taking mm-hmm. an, a time out of my day to serve other people and to think about something other than myself, a higher power. Mm-hmm. And I've been able to successfully um, get to a place of peace where I am able to get from the religion a lot um, of comfort and peace while at the same time shedding those things that don't resonate with me. And I don't that not everybody can do that, but it it has worked for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know I totally understand that. And one of the things that I love about LDS is I do love the commitment to service and mm-hmm. you know something greater than ourselves. And you know, we, I, I swear we weren't going to talk about politics, but I think everybody can agree that the country's not in a great place for whatever mm-hmm. reason. And my husband, who's former military, and he will say, and I think I agree with him, he goes, you know, we'll never reinstitute the draft. But, but if we did, um, and if not the draft, something where everybody has to commit to the, to something mm-hmm. at a high school, it can be the Peace Corps, it can, it's something other where you understand it's not all about you. Mm-hmm. He feels, he feels so strongly that so many of the problems that we have today would disappear because everybody is so self-centric now. And that's one of the things I absolutely adore about all the LDS people that I know, that that two years of service just leaves such a mark on who you are as a person. Yes, and I would agree with you on that. And it is interesting. We have six children. Now I've remarried and and blended family, six children, none of which are LDS. And, well, one, you I mean guess they left the church. Yes, they, they all, all left the church. All but I should say one. One is active, um, uh, fairly active LDS, but the rest have left. And and for me, there's Did not something else. Did they join something else? No, no, but not anything formal. I think, especially m- most of Gen Z and and many younger millennials don't resonate with organized religion, but they're very right. spiritual people. And I would, I would characterize all of our children that way, very spiritual. And what I told them is pick something you love, pick something you yeah. do believe in. I don't care if it's religious or not, but I want you to care about something and I want you yeah. to affiliate with something. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's very important. So that's, that's how they they live their lives. And I would say every single one of them are very deeply spiritual people. That's great. And, you know, it's interesting because sometimes people leave the religion that they're raised in. And then when they have children, they come back to it. All mm-hmm. of a sudden, something that wasn't important mm-hmm. to them became important. So, Well, I, I look at it this way. I mean, I think diversity is an important principle of our lives. I think, you know, the reason that we have the stars in the sky balanced against a dark, dark black sky the stars are so beautiful. And I, and I think we have to have diversity at uh, diversity at work, diversity in thoughts. And I think the different beliefs that people bring to the table is actually what makes it so beautiful. And mm-hmm. to have people believe in different things, I think just makes it so much more rich here on our planet. Right. So yeah, I'll right. take, I'll take whatever diversity I can get in whatever form I can get. Right. That's great. That's great. So tell us a little bit. uh, I have a feeling that your service to others has very much impacted your role as the job doctor. So I know you're dying to talk about that. Uh, Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't look at myself and say, I'm, I'm a person who's always serving, but I, but but that doesn't mean you're not, but I I think it's just who you are. I, the, the reason I started the job doctor is because I wanted to help people. I didn't want them to have 
the same questions that I had in my career and stumble around. Besides that, when you're in HR, you see behind the scenes. So you get to see how these things play out behind the scenes. And trust me, people don't understand what's being said behind the scenes. They don't understand why they didn't get the job or or why they didn't get the raise. And I really have felt like uh, so I wanted on a to second. Move- Let me interrupt you for mm-hmm. a moment. Let sure. me interrupt you for a moment. Because I'll be full disclosure. I think HR drives me crazy. Uh, HR drives it, everybody crazy. I, I think it's it's the it's such a they, they spend so much time to, on full disclosure, just trying to make doing things to try to make themselves relevant. And why is there no transparency? Why does somebody not know the truth about why they didn't get the job? The truth about why they didn't get the raise? Why does why is that such a big secret? I know yeah. I'm sounding like excited no, because great. I'm dealing with a uh, big company now. They just went through a huge layoff. And, and and the transparency, in spite of what they think, the executives think, mm-hmm. is zero. They let somebody go yesterday, gave her one hour. This was someone that was there for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Gave her, talk, what a disgrace. Gave her one hour, closed everything out. Guess what? In three weeks, whatever it is, soon they have this huge event. She has all the information for her and all the files. Of they course. have no information. She gets a text this morning. Mm-hmm. Oh, would you mind? You know, sorry about what happened to you, blah, blah, blah. Would you mind if we get on a call? I told her, no, you're not getting on a call. Your employment ended at five o'clock yesterday. If they want to mm-hmm. bring you on as a contractor, knock yourself out. So why is there that disconnect? It, it, help help well, us understand that. I would say, first of all, understand HR's job isn't to help everybody get along. And no, HR's job to is to minimize company. it's to minimize risk for the company. That's what HR's job is. Correct. And I don't say that to be negative on HR because I actually mm-hmm. understand the great value that H- good HR people can bring to a company. I really do. But it, it isn't HR's fault people aren't honest sometimes. People across the board avoid conflict. You do, I do, managers do, everybody does. And so part of what happens is we don't tell the truth in part because there's risk to the company and we don't want to get sued. So that's one. And we can get mad about that maybe. But the other well, is hang because- on second. We're hang, just on not second. Good. hang on one hang, second. Hang on one second. Let, let's sure. go there. Mm-hmm. So of course people don't want to get sued. But that, would, but that leads me to the question- then why are decisions being made about people's career that impact them and their family Mm -hmm. and supposedly the company as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are those decisions made in a way that might jeopardize the company legally? Well, okay. I love this because let's take the scenario that you just gave me. If the company shares with specificity why she was let go, it does open them up because she's a woman in a protected class. Let's say she's a woman and she's over 40. I mean, oh, just well, you're throwing other variables in now. Okay. And okay. that nonsense. Okay. So, go ahead. Yeah. So, anything the company shares that's really specific, they either better back it up with tons of emails and tons of data to say well, this is course. actually what happened, or, of course, right? Which opens the everything they say opens them up to risk of somebody saying, well, you did that wrong. You interpreted that wrong. Or the company can say, I'm going to exercise my at will right to to let this person go, not give a ton of detail. And then the burden is on the person who gets let go to say, well, you discriminated against me and here's the evidence to show it. And so companies often try and hit this middle ground where they give you just enough to know things aren't working out. And most companies that are responsible try to have a paper trail around performance appraisals and and either we like you or don't like you. But because people are so poor at actually having the direct conversations with clarity, then oftentimes they say less when they let you go because it protects the company more than if they said more. I don't know if that okay, makes sense. I understand that. I, mm-hmm. I understand that. And uh, two questions. One is, has that issue gotten worse? Over the years. And the second Mm -hmm. question is, so then why doesn't HR teach people how to have the difficult conversation? Well, I will tell you from my 25 years, 
the best HR leaders are teaching their managers, teaching their management team how to have hard conversations. Doesn't mean people still want, doesn't mean people want to have them. Just think about marriages, failure rates in marriages and, and people who leave. How many times do you hear somebody left and they're like, I had no idea there was a problem. We have halfway conversations at work. And despite whatever training HR or anybody else gives, we're, most people will default to a halfway conversation and say what is halfway to the truth and hope that somebody understands 100% of what they're trying to say. And as a result, we are left, all of us, decoding what is actually happening. It's one of mm-hmm. my biggest frustrations with the workplace. And if you look at my book, The Unspoken Truths for Career Success, almost every chapter has woven into it the conversations you need to have and communication is a theme, just this recurring theme that if you as an individual get better at communicating, your career can go where you want it to go. And as a manager, you can have better experiences with your people. So much is solved with better communication. Well, everything is communication. So I guess the devil's advocate advocate response, which you sort of kind of already answered though, is why is the onus on the employee to bring up that difficult conversation? For example, just like in a marriage, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let, let, let's, let's do the stereotype. The guy thinks he's crushing it, right? Right. He buys you flowers. Maybe he's doing well with his career. Mm-hmm. Um, and the wife is just so lonely. Mm-hmm. And, and if she doesn't tell him... <clears throat> He doesn't change. Or what happens is she asks for a divorce and he's like, why didn't you tell me? She goes, I have been telling you, but the message wasn't communicated, right? Yeah, she said right. the words, mm-hmm. but he didn't hear her. So in a company, if, if somebody, many people think they're doing either a, you know, a slam dunk job or probably more accurately, it's good enough. Like, mm-hmm. especially we have two or three generations where good enough is good enough. Good enough. Don't even, mm-hmm. don't even get me started on that. But the truth of the matter is 50% of the people are average. So 50% of your employees will be average, which to me suggests good enough. But if it's not good enough, then the onus, do you not think, is on the employee to tell them that? It's everybody's responsibility to be talking. So managers... Managers will come to me. This they is, don't know anything about leadership. They managers, manage. uh, man, yeah, managers don't typically get training in this, and managers are expected to communicate clearly, and you know, with their people if there's a problem. But more, what happens more times than not is a manager will come to me and they'll say, "Hey, I've got to let Jane go," and I'll say, "You know, does Jane know it's coming?" And they mm-hmm. will always say, of course, yes, absolutely, Jane knows it's coming. And the one thing I know for sure, Jane doesn't know it's coming. And that is a failure on clear communication because a manager often will say, hey, Jane, um, I need you to be to watch the accuracy of that document. You know, I've seen a couple mistakes. That may be the manager's version if I was clear just like it might be the spouse's version of, hey, I need to see you more. I don't see you very much, thinking I had Mm -hmm. the conversation. When in fact, the conversation Mm -hmm. needed to be, Jane, when you first came, I noticed that you were getting most of these documents and proposals right. But lately, let me show you these six really critical mistakes that you've made. And Mm -hmm. I've noticed that that it's increasing. Is there something going on that that I need to understand that would help me? And is, is there something we can do to help you? And then follow up and say, it's getting better. Or it's not getting better. That doesn't happen very often. But I would also say on the other side of the coin, I asked my followers, would you bring up, if you were upset at a company, would you bring it up? 94% said I would leave the company before I would bring it up. Why? Because they said I shouldn't have to write the script for the company. So I when I- that. Hang on, let me just, I just mm-hmm. want to say yeah. something. Mm-hmm. So- when I am coaching people, this happens all the time with really smart people, CEOs, see this top leadership. Um, what you just said, I have to let Jane go. And you and and you said, does she know? And the person said yes. My response is okay, yes, as evidenced by what? Right. That's what a good HR team right. will do is evidenced by what right. 
mm-hmm. as evidence by what? So, um, and and then if they say, well, it's one from here to here, they must know. Say, no, you know, you think, and this happens at the highest level. And in fairness to people, they are really, for the most part, I think, overworked. I think it, it's, in, uh, and no one, I'm I would such agree. a work dog myself, but, you know, I have a horrible boss myself, right? So it's different when your name is on the door. Mm-hmm. But I think people are overworked, overloaded, and th- we're not taught leadership. We're not we're not taught communication. But unless you tell an employee that their work is lacking, I, I do feel that onus is on the leadership management. Do you feel different? I do. No, I do feel like you, the onus is on management. Okay. But I also feel that if a person is not happy with something that's happening at work, say I'm overworked, my manager keeps loading things on as people leave rather than hiring enough help, there's an onus on you as well to say, or at least it will help, it can help you more than you realize to say to your manager, hey, I wanted to talk to you about something that's on my mind. I've no, you know, my expectation was that my job would be this. And what's happened over the course of time is you've added this, this, and this. I'm finding that it's very difficult to manage all of those things. And as a result, I feel like I'm less effective. Um, Is that what you intended? I mean, what a great conversation to have with your manager rather than just leaving swipe right, swipe left, which is kind Mm -hmm. of the, uh, what we're living in this world where we just, we cancel Mm -hmm. to have that conversation and be able to resolve that helps you in so many ways. Because if you can have those kinds of conversations, you have more of a chance of A, being happy in your job and B, being a more promotable person. Because we, as you grow in an organization, you have to be able to address conflict. It's a fatal flaw if you can't. Okay, so let me um, let me play uh, the objection and how you help people with this. Mm-hmm, when sure. you say to an employee, you have to, and, and I do this too, you have to go to your manager, you have to go to your board, you have to let them know that you are drowning. And the employee will stay at every level. But if I do that, then I will be labeled be fired. a complainer. No, well, no, no, not that, but a complainer. Mm-hmm. I'm not a team player. Take one for the team. And, and, and from the company's perspective, that drives me crazy. And I just mm-hmm. did a blog on this is don't worry in a year or six months, you know, I know you took on the work of two people. We'll take care of you. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. So how do you, how do you get over that objection from someone? When you actually test it, you will find that more times than not, it's not true. More times than Mm -hmm. not. Now I'm not saying you don't occasionally get somebody that's just a, Mm -hmm you know, horrible company, horrible manager, but more times than not, managers don't have a crystal ball to know when you're full. They just, right, they true, simply true. don't. Fair enough. You are the only right. one that knows when you're full. And I think most people fall down on this because they don't know how to have the conversation the right way. They tend to either go silent because it's safer or they go scorched to earth, which can get them the label of being a troublemaker. And so that's why so many chapters in the book are dedicated to how do you have a safe conversation about this? Because that's the most common thing I hear from people. I'm overloaded. I'm burned out. My manager keeps giving me stuff and I'm, I'm not winning um, either because I'm not getting paid for it or I'm, I'm just I'm crashing and burning here. And so mm-hmm. I think it's having the right conversation the right way that can make the biggest difference around that. And some of that is just. I call it a choices discussion with your manager that you need to be having on a regular basis to align to, hey, manager, here's the top priorities, second priorities, third priorities. I want to make sure that you agree with this because the third priorities are the things that are going to get the least amount of attention. And if and there will be times I can't get to them. Do we agree that the, we're going to win by doing the first priorities? You're training your manager in many ways to get aligned with you on these things. That helps helps you with burnout more than any single thing I know is to have that regular conversation over and over. And then the choices part comes in when they say, well, we have to do it all. Well, I understand if we do it all, all of it's going to be done sort of good, but not good because I'm full. And so 
I want you, our department, and me, our department to win. And it seems to me that these first priorities are the, the areas that we will win. But if we choose to do everything, we're going to lose even in these important areas. The, that discussion is a really, that I would say every employee needs to learn to have that discussion on a regular basis. Uh, since since you've been doing this, which is four years, right? Pre-COVID? Mm-hmm. COVID. COVID. Yep. What's, COVID. What's the most dramatic shift that you've seen in the oh. unspoken truths and how it plays out? I wish, I wish people could see the letters I get. It's just absolutely so incredible. This is how I help people. This is my service to people. Um, I have seen someone, I helped someone get a hundred thousand dollar raise, which I thought was insanity and wonderful. So we had to pick, pick, uh, apart what their what value was the percentage. What was, the, what was that percentage of their, they, they, they got a hundred thousand dollar raise. No, no, I understand that. But what mm-hmm. was the percentage of the salary that they had? Was it a hundred percent? Was it 50%? Was it 200, like were they making a hundred thousand dollars and they got bumped to two hundred thousand dollars? Like, what's yeah, that they percentage? were making about one seventy five, and then they okay, got another. so mm-hmm. so it was really yeah, it was significant. Um, I have seen. I I got a letter from a woman who said, because I used your principles and I've been following you and having these conversations, I'm one of five experts in the entire country that now does this one job, and I got into it without having the credentials that were the the perfect credentials, but because I was able to have the conversations and um, prove my my results were good and my outcomes were good, I have moved into a position that I never dreamed possible. And I get I get variations of that every single day. Uh, they're the they're the greatest thing in the world to get a message saying you changed my life or a single mother that said, I thought I was going to be cleaning houses forever. And I didn't think I would be able to help my children. I'm now making over a hundred thousand dollars a year in the the tech industry. I'm like, yes, you know, you had the courage mm-hmm. to to make the pivot, to make the shift. And I love those stories. Great. Okay, so so give us what are the three most common unspoken truths for success. Hmm, okay. Uh, okay, I would say one is that. And this is typically kind of a, I talk about the five stages of career growth, the first three stages of your career. So up to kind of mid-level, people believe if they do their job description better, that they, that that's the key to success and that someone will realize that they are doing a wonderful job and promote them. Yeah, and it's not how it works. best kept secret. Yeah. yeah. So uh, following your job description is a horrible, horrible um prescription for success because your mm-hmm. the job description was written by somebody in HR in a dark room at 5 p.m. at night before they went home. You, well, it's you, also a baseline. Yeah. And you need to understand what the real job is from the job on paper. And they're always different. So right. that would be one. Right. Uh, I would say another unspoken truth is that um, the company has all the leverage when it comes to pay. Um, a lot of people believe the company knows what they're going to pay for the job. They know what their budget is. They hold the purse strings. Therefore, they have the power. And that is not true. I talk about all the ways that you have leverage, but knowledge, scarcity for, of for resource. Example, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if, let's say that um, several people left on the team and you're left and there's a deadline for something critical. You have an enormous amount of leverage. Let's say you have a specialized skill that only you can do. You have tremendous leverage and people don't understand what leverage is and how much they have to negotiate their pay. Hang on one second. So so I, I totally agree with you on that. However, what about these companies where, um, well, we just laid off. You have mm-hmm. the skill set. That's why you're here. And it's not in the budget now, which we all know there's always special money. Like, you know, yeah. the exec- the CEO Dry. can raise anybody's, yeah. right? So so how do you- how Dry do you promotions, someone we call those. Counter that, yeah, the dry promotions. Um, first of all, I, I like to help reframe it for people. I, sure. I, I, first of all, yes, you always are going to try and get the money that is associated with the pay increase. However, all is not lost. If you don't get the pay increase up front, the next thing I would do, get the title. The title is worth something to you, but it's delayed. It's for the next job. Mm -hmm. If you get a title increase, I I would say it's generally worth about 10 grand to you, more as you go higher up. 
So that's something that's that's definitely worth taking that promotion for. Secondly, companies, especially at high levels, boards and executives love if-then proposals. That's how executives are paid. If you do this, then you get this. If you can make the stock price go here, you get this extra you know, bonus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah. And, and because companies love what's free, get the title, that's free. And companies love to hold off on, they like to see results before they give. And so an if-then proposal can be extraordinarily powerful to say, all right, if I'm able to do X, what's important to them for this expanded role, then could we give me an increase in three months, in six months? Can we do a review and get that in writing? Most companies, if it's delayed, will say, I'm interested, especially if you can tie a result to it. So I would say negotiate for the future raise over just shrugging your shoulders and taking on more responsibility in, you know, in perpetuity, because I think that's where the losing proposition is. Okay. So I do a lot of work also helping people negotiate, like how to have it, how to negotiate for a raise. Mm -hmm. And the, most companies will pay you for your value add going forward and they won't pay you for what you did it for what you did in the past. Yes. So just mm-hmm. to answer that, I, I get that. Yeah, you're right. I think it's great. Mm-hmm. So how, how do you bridge that gap? Okay. So I, I just have to say this then, because that's one of the other truths that I would bring up is companies are companies are always going to come at it from a perspective of what have you done for me lately? Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. And so your ability to always have your eye on the future, and I call it playing in the gap, solving what the biggest problems are between what they want to be and what they actually are. There's always a gap. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. how you're going to get the biggest raises and increases. So sorry, go back just a minute Mm -hmm. on your last question, because I forgot part of it. And I want to make sure I answer. No, that's okay. Is that is that what happened with the client that you helped get the hundred thousand dollar raise? Did she fill the gap? Um, what we were able to do, most people don't know how to tell their own story about their brand and what they are able to do. So the best way to illustrate this is if I'm trying to get a job and I say, you want to hire me because I'm a 25 year HR professional and I've, and I know how to run recruiting and benefits that is not compelling. But if I can address the problems that I can solve for a company, come at it from what's in it for them then mm-hmm. I can be successful. So I would pitch myself as I'm the person you'd hire. If you want to go fast and scale quickly, have a liquidity event or have high merger acquisitions, I'm mm-hmm. the person you hire to build the infrastructure to go fast. That's my value proposition. And most people do not know what theirs is. They, mm-hmm. they can recite a job d- description that they've done, but they don't know how to say, here's how I solve or have solved problems for you. And when you can do that and share the measurements of how you've materially made a difference, then you have a powerful, um, Mm -hmm. you have a powerful story that companies Mm -hmm. can get behind. But most people, go ahead, no finish, please. Most people are asking for raises, for example, they'll say, I haven't had a raise for a few years and Jane left and I took on her responsibilities and, um, you know, I've worked really hard for you, blah, blah, blah. That every single thing I said in that raise request comes at it from what I want, what I I, get it, right? You have to come at it from what does the company get? If you can make Mm -hmm. that pivot, you will be more successful in, in the jobs Mm -hmm. you get, in the money you earn. Mm -hmm. All right. This is going to be a funky question. Um, How do you see AI changing the role of workers? Yeah, as it relates AI. to say, I could be specific in their mm-hmm. value proposition. AI is going to really throw us for a loop. Um, it'll be helpful and awful all at once. It's going to eliminate mm-hmm. many, many roles, like 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 old paradigm shifts. Uh, yeah, there, there's just going to be jobs that don't exist anymore. So people well, who are the in, attorneys, yeah, legal. Yeah, is that's just, right. And and You're quite right. frankly, I I I am not. No, no, no sleep lost over that. I mean, they, they bill clients for their associates to learn the law. Well, what I'm worried about, be gone. They are gone. And, and the ones I worry about are the people that are in like a stage two career where they're perhaps in customer support uh, or a transactional Mm. job. Those are going away. They're, they're in process of going away. And so people have to understand, move out of the jobs that are going away 
get the skills to move into the jobs that are going to stay, I think that regardless of what level I'm at, learning AI and how it can help, this is a really good time in history for you to learn about it and be taking classes to utilize AI because you can at this point in time go into your company and say, hey, I know how to use AI and we can streamline this, we can fix this, we can make this more efficient. And that helps your value proposition because not mm-hmm. every, it's not everybody doesn't know how to use it yet. So I would be right. at regardless of level learning about AI. But AI, I think, is going to play such a big part in the future that, um, boy, you better be getting skills that can't be done by AI if you really want to make money and be secure, or at least know how to partner with AI to do the job better. Well, you know, I always say my job's recession and AI proof because it's all relationship skills, right? It's all how to develop a relationship. But what AI will do, the understand my understanding is it the the person that has an expertise will always, for example, we talked about law. The expert in law will always be needed, and AI will help make that more efficient. Right. Um, but you know, like who is it? The Jensen, I think is his name, the CEO of NVIDIA mm-hmm. said. You don't need, and and I've heard engineers say this, don't learn coding. No one's going to need to know how to code anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? So what would, what would your advice be to people entering the workforce other than what you just said, learn AI, you know, know how to implement it to make things more streamlined. What, what other advice would you give new people in the workforce? In the workforce. I would, I would probably study those positions that are expanding Mm -hmm. exponentially. And I would understand where we're expanding and where we're shrinking. That's advice, regardless of AI, that people should be looking into. I always tell people, don't go into shrinking, shrinking industries, industries that are dying. Don't do it. Go into the industries that are burgeoning that are growing. So mm-hmm. option mm-hmm. having options and customization is a concept that is like here to stay. And it, we're especially seeing it in healthcare. Um, and so, you know, I don't have an exact answer into the, the exact jobs, although I know supply chain I'm very interested in. And I think that's going to be something that would be really interesting in the future. Anything with healthcare and especially Personalized healthcare, I think, would be something very interesting in the future. And AI can't, AI can get your voice down, sort of, but it can't replace what somebody can do um, creatively yet mm-hmm. to, to right, actually right. help with like digital marketing and make it sound perfect. It help. You've got to use digital marketing to get you your head start, but you're not going to have the end product done by AI yeah. entirely. Good, but good. Yeah. I, I, you I know what? I this is so weird. I had somebody call me the other day and say, You can use AI, Tessa, if you know you're running out of you don't you only have so many mentoring spots, but we can actually take your face and the video that's on you and all of your book and everything you've ever said on TikTok, and we can make an AI figure so that people can ask you questions and AI will answer it as if it's you in video. Nobody will know the difference and it will be accurate advice. I was like, Whoa. Can you do it? No, I, I, I'm not ready to do that yet. I'm not ready to do that yet, but I I thought it was really crazy that we can do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So I want to be respectful of your time, although I could talk to you all day. I have just one more question and then I want you to unabashedly promote yourself. So imagine there's a box in front of you and inside that box has everything in your entire life that you've ever lost. What's the first thing you would reach for to take out of the box and why? Oh, that box is big. That is a big box. Um, oh, that's hard because the place that I'm going, you know, if you follow me, you know, my son tried to take his life eight months ago. Mm-hmm. He shot himself in the neck and ended up clipping C1 and C3 and he was paralyzed. And he's been learning to walk again, and he will have lifetime disabilities as a result of that. It's really hard for me to get outside of that experience because what I want is is happiness and health for my family and my children mm-hmm. in particular. And so it's hard for me to say, 
what do I want out of that box? Because I'm happy when they're happy. You know, you're never happy. Like every than mother. You're, you're never happy Least than happy your kid. most unhappy kid, right? So that's that's what I would want. I, I suppose what I would grab out of that box is is peace. And pe- if there mm. were peace in my life, I would know that those other things have have come to a place where my children have found who they are and are making their way in the world. I think that to me would be the very most important thing. That's absolutely beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay. Unabashedly promote yourself. Tell people where they can go to get your book, to learn more about you, to work with you. Go. Okay. Well, they can find me on thejobdoctor.com. That's where you can find uh, my rates for keynote speaking. That's what I do most of. I do keynote speaking at companies and they can also, I do some private mentoring and we are just getting ready to turn on a mentoring platform for people where they have access Mm -hmm. to me and I will mentor and we'll bring other experts on. So that's number one. Number two, they can, my podcast is on Apple and Spotify. The job doctor is in and they can find me on pretty much any social media platform. And I, I, TikTok's my favorite and I do a lot of lives there where I do Q and A's. So, you know, I'm pretty much, I'm all over the place. You're going to, you're going to stumble all over me if you're looking for career help. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I, I know we, we went in so many different directions, but your work is invaluable. Thank you for being a good sport. Um, and I encourage everybody to follow the job doctor and to get her book, to learn more about her mentoring you have everything to gain. And that concludes today's podcast episode of Dr. Patty and Podcast. Make sure you like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. And until next time, be well. Thank you. <music>